I remember the first time I met Bill, it was in Tri-Cities, and I was pretty much in awe. I was a kind of a long-haired, pimply-faced kid, it was my first race, and I walked up and introduced myself to him, and I said, hello, Mr. Muncie, I'm Chip Hanauer, and he said, I know who you are, and he said, you're gonna do just fine, and then he walked off, and I was just thrilled that the guy even knew who I, that I existed. Uh, that was one of the most poignant things I remember about Bill as far as moments. The first time I really felt like, wow, this is Unlimited's and this is the big leagues is lining up for a start in Seattle and I had uh, Bill Muncy next to me and I was like, wow, I remember looking over and actually breaking my concentration and go, wow, that's Bill Muncy and I'm on a race course with him. What's interesting about Bill and, and my relationship with him is when I came in the sport, I came in and I thought I was pretty badass, you know, I mean, I figured I could beat anybody in anything. This Bill Muncy thing, because I was never an Unlimited fan. I always thought they got all this credit, but you know, it's not that competitive. There's not that many boats. What's the big deal? And I thought this Bill Muncy character is probably just, you know, kind of a name. And it wasn't until I actually saw him drive and watched him over a period of time that went, man, he's the real deal. It's not just a PR deal. Growing up in Seattle, you know, I kept hearing about Bill Muncy being kind of the black-hatted bad guy. Um, I really didn't follow Unlimited Hydroplanes growing up. I mean, I was aware of them and I kind of watched Seafair half-heartedly, but I was racing outboards and the Nationals were always the same weekend as Seafair. So I really didn't follow him much, but I do remember him being cast in kind of the villain role. But when I got into the sport, the, that didn't exist at all. I mean, I didn't see the other drivers look at him and I think it was more media generated than it was reality and you know it was good for the sport though i mean it was good for the sport in seattle because he was uh, deemed a you know evil detroit detroiter and uh, it was good for the sport oh no, too shabby was it too shabby how what were the speeds uh, let's open it up on a two shot okay okay what were the speeds were they very fast uh, 112 was your fastest uh, so it wasn't really uh you all set to go okay Bill Muncy back on the winning trail after a loss last week to the Budweiser. That makes five out of six. Bill, you have to be delighted. Oh, we are. We're really pleased. <laughs> it's been a long tour thus far, Jim, and we hope to conclude it successfully in San Diego. And we're really looking forward to that because, as you know, I haven't, the, haven't had the greatest fortune <laughs> in, in San Diego after all these years. I've never been able to win there. I've even went, gone down there running strong, but just haven't really been uh, able to pull off a victory. So I'm hoping that uh, this year we're as good or better prepared than we've ever been to win in San Diego. And Bill Muncy has also wrapped up the national championship with this win here in Seattle. Jim Hendrick reporting for TV2 Sports. Okay. Bernie Little is the winningest owner in hydro history, and he's not going to give up. I understand there's going to be a new boat next year, Bernie. Yes, there is, Jim. Uh, the Budweiser camp has uh, led a contract to build a new hydroplane, and uh, we hope to get delivery by the end of December, and uh, we think that that will remedy a lot of problems. Well, the Budweiser was a defending national champion until they lost it today here on Lake Washington in Seattle, but Bernie Little is the kind of guy that he doesn't take no for an answer. He wants to win all the way and win he has and win he will. This is Jim Hendrick for TV2 Sports in Seattle. The blood pressure, the heartbeat, the nerves, coordination, the courage of this 51-year-old man are just fine. His name is Bill Muncy, and he's about to drive an unlimited hydroplane on a tough, tough afternoon of racing. I really remember, I remember how to do that now. I'm convinced older's better. I really am. And the reason is, is I'm driving faster than I've ever driven, and I'm not an exceptional guy. I've had an interesting background, and I've had certain skills that I've been able to lend to a racing atmosphere. But, you know, why do people all of a sudden, when they reach 50, think, oh, I got 15 years to die, so they proceed to get ready for it? When, if they would stay with what they're doing and keep at it, they'd 
better and better and better. And I think that's exactly what I'm proving decisively, and nothing else by racing, is that, hey, if the older you are, the better you are, because you've got conditioned reflexes, you've got background, you've got experience. What good are reflexes if you're in your 20s if you don't really know what to do, you know? Today, Bill Munchie drives this boat, trying for his 54th career win as we present the Grand Prix of Unlimited Hydroplane Racing, the Gold Cup. Hello again, everybody. I'm Keith Jackson. It was 25 years ago that I covered my first Unlimited Hydroplane race, and in those days, the Gold Cup was the race. It still very much is the race. There are names on this old trophy that go back so many years to Garwood and Guy Lombardo. So many of the men who raced with such courage and heart in this competition are no longer with us, but they will be remembered forever because of what they could do with an unlimited hydroplane and what they did do with their lives. Today, as we go to this 1979 Gold Cup race, there is a name that goes back 25 years in it, Bill Muncie. People who started chasing him in the middle 50s and they are still chasing this rascal as he performs so nobly and once again tries to win a Gold Cup for a third successive time. Only one other man's ever done it. That was Ron Musson in the middle 60s. The question now is whether or not there is anyone here who can really run down Bill Muncie. Will it be Steve Reynolds, the youngster who is driving the circus circus boat and driving it so very well, apparently an emerging star in unlimited hydroplane racing? Or could it be Dean Chenoweth, who is coming off four years of retirement? The year before I came to the Atlas, Bill had been winning like, Bill and Jim had been winning like crazy, huh? But Bernie and David got the Griffins and put it in a boat. And they went and got Dean, and Dean came back and started driving for him. So Bill and Dean had, had com competed with one another uh, in er years earlier, and they were, both of them were very well... Uh, aware of one another's skills. But the first year, they had some problems with the Griffin. I know there are times, Bill, when I sit back and remember names like Wagner, Kaiser, yeah. Rhodes, Sayers, oh, yeah. and names like Manchester, oh, yeah. Musson, yeah. Donnie Wilson, yeah. Bill Stead. Yeah. And it, it kind of reaches inside of you because these are people that we lived with, traveled with, and you fought with. Oh, indeed. No question. You never forget. At least I found this out. I, I've not ever been able to deal with death very well. I, I don't think I've handled myself well. You never forget things like that, ever. I mean, every day of my life, I'm reminded somehow of some one of those guys. But you do, you know, you do blank it out. I think the human psyche is such that we can blank it out and not allow it to affect my performance. I wouldn't want it to do that, just in respect to them, because they made a great country, not only their lives, but they did other things to help get the public's attention to our sport, and they were superb drivers, the best available. I've never, it, it still bothers me very much, all of those all those names that, that lost their lives in our sport. I, but I am able to blank it out, and, and I don't think it affects me performance-wise. Those comments from yesterday, the ultimate veteran, Bill Muncy, right there, hard hat in place, getting ready to go. Just over there, the brash young rookie, Steve Reynolds. We'll see what happens in the final. It is a very fast field with Circus Circus Steve Reynolds. Atlas Van Lines with Bill Muncy. Tri-Cities Tile with Jack Schaefer Jr. Squire Sharp with Chip Hanauer and Dr. Toyota with Bob Mashman. And as they come down off this turn now, you're looking from a helicopter carrying a camera. And as they make their move down for the start, you don't want to jump the gun. You want momentum. You want RPM. You want the horsepower ready to go. Inside, it's Hanauer. It's Squire Sharp. Circus Circus. comes across the starting line in the number three or possibly four position. But as they go into the first turn, they'll begin to sort themselves out because some of them run faster in the turns than others. And right now, it is young Steve Reynolds in the Circus Circus coming off turn number two and taking the lead down the back straight. But on the outside, it is Bill Muncy. And Muncy is gone. And the Circus Circus with a flash of fire. It looks like he might have blown a supercharger. But he hangs on, but he drops back into second place, getting a little bit of fighting action at 
Richard Muncy comes storming down off turn number two and runs through the back straight and takes the lead, and there's the old crafty veteran laying it on him, Jim. Coming off a of corner number two, Keith, the Circus Circus with Steve Reynolds almost lost it. And then it loaded up at a big stack fire, but he did manage to get it back under control, but now trails, Bill, by about eight boat lengths. Muncie is on the inside now. Watch him. He'll hug that boy. When he gets inside and in front, he could be long gone because he has the proven equipment. He has won the first three races of 1979, and Lord knows he's got all the experience in the world in his hand. He gets a little high and does a little fighting as he comes down the lead at the end of lap number one. Let's take a moment and go back to that second turn in the first lap and watch this violent action involving Circus Circus on the inside. Keith, it looks as though that tight number one lane is too much for Steve Reynolds and the Circus Circus hits a hole. He bounces around, it's like trying to control a wild steed. His foot comes off the accelerator, raw fuel hits the stacks, causing a flash fire in the stacks and losing power momentarily, giving Muncie a, a big edge as he goes down the chutes. And that's always a welcome sign, isn't it? When you get that far out in front and when you're running in rough conditions like this, I know that automobile racers and uh, unlimited hydroplane people do the same thing. They always start listening for something. Sometimes the driver will hold his breath from the exit bin to the entrance bin all the way down the straight shoes. Bill Muncy turning down off turn number two, running through the back straight. He's got the back straight two turns and the home straight to go, and the Gold Cup is his for an eighth time. What an incredible career he's had. Now Muncy will make his turn. Having lapped Dr. Toyota, he is on the home straight right now with a checkered flag high in the air being held by a man who put in a lot of miles in unlimited racing, Freddie Alter. And here comes Bill Muncy from La Mesa, California. He wins the Gold Cup for the eighth time. Coming on to finish in second place will be the Circus Circus. And the victory celebration is on for Bill Muncy and the Atlas Van Lines crew, Jim Lucero, the crew chief who prepared the boat so well. And Bill Muncy now with 54 total career victories, including eight Gold Cup wins, and he has become only the second driver in history to win the Gold Cup three successive times. Keith Jackson, Jim Henrik from Madison, Indiana. When Bernie came out with those, uh, they the first year... It wasn't real dramatic. You know, he didn't win much, but everyone could see the potential. And the second year, uh, they were magnificent. I mean, they were really uh, powerful. They, the Budweiser crew had really done their homework and done a great job. Dave Culley, who was the crew chief of the Budweiser at the time, came up with the Griffin idea. And Dave Culley had a huge respect for Bill, and he knew that he had to give his driver an unfair advantage. I, I think he even told me that at one point, and he believed he had come up with it when he did the Griffin, and I believe the Griffin was 600 cubic inches bigger, and uh, that was the Bill Muncy, that was how they were going to deal with Bill Muncy, is just purely out horsepower him. I never spoke with Bill about straightaway records, but I talked with Dean at length about doing it, and I desperately tried to talk him out of it during the Seattle run where he actually had the accident. I told him it was a bad idea, it was worth nothing, it didn't prove a thing. He went ahead and did it, and sure enough, uh, he had an accident, the boat flipped, he was injured, and they took him to the hospital. And I remember being summoned that night by somebody, they were running me down saying, Dean desperately wants to talk to you. And I remember walking into the hospital and Dean laying there in the bed saying, I, you told me, you told me, I shouldn't have done it. Muncie does swing wide. He's on the extreme, outside. Here they come for the start. It looked like a possibility that the Circus Circus jumped the gun. The Circus Circus is in the lead, but it was awfully close whether the Circus Circus jumped the gun. All right, we'll pick up the action as they go into the south turn with the Circus Circus in the lead. But we'll have to confirm whether the Circus Circus did it the gun. From this vantage point, it looked like it was awfully close to call. Coming out of the north turn, the Circus Circus has the lead. Budweiser, number two on the inside. Atlas, number three on the outside. Circus Circus with about a half a buoy length lead over the 
Budweiser in second place. And Muncie going up the back stretch who was hidden in the rooster tail of the spray of the Budweiser. I couldn't find him. But certainly he's in the path. So a three-boat race for the Circus Circus coming out of the south turn. And up the back stretch. Budweiser in second place. And Muncie's going to the outside. Muncie is on the outside of the Budweiser, but the Budweiser hits it. And Chenoweth picks up speed. We've got a dogfight for second place between the Bud and Muncie. Muncie with a half a boat length lead over the second place boat, the Budweiser. The Circus Circus still in first place with a time of 120.401. Going into the north turn of lap number two, the Circus Circus still holding on to first place. Muncie closing ground. We've got a win of the boat race. One of the best I've seen so far. Muncie closing down in the outside, swinging close to the buoy. He's grabbed. He's cut off the Budweiser. He cut off the Budweiser. Circus Circus is your leader. Muncie, second place. Budweiser in third place. There's been two guys, I think, in the sport that really understood how to take care of sponsors, and Bill and Bernie Little is the other one. And Bill not only took care of his own sponsor, but he took care of your sponsors. I remember in Seattle, I drove the Squire Shop. They were the sponsor of the race, actually. Uh, the Squire Shop never got the credit for saving Seafair. At one point, Seafair was almost not going to happen because they couldn't get sponsorship. And Bob Style and Squire Shop stepped up and sponsored the race. And for a little clothing retailer, that was a big deal. And I feel he never got the credit. But unfortunately, in the Squire shop I was driving, we didn't make the final heat. And Bill felt horrible about that. And he knew what a blow was to the sponsor. So he got in the boat. He wore a Squire shop jacket, I think. And he got, a, got out of the boat and wore a Squire shop hat. Always conscious of the commerce of, of racing. And I uh, really took care of everybody that distinguished that distinguished red. You look We thought we'd have a lot of fun dealing with it. We're sad that they didn't get on it. And I really wanted to run and have an Atlas Van Lines truck run over them, to be honest. <laughs> but anyway, there are some great sports and a neat outfit, and we're glad they're in the sport, and they didn't get in the final heat, so we're going to represent them the best way we can. But the question mark, the question mark is, did the Circus Circus jump the gun? Did the Circus Circus jump the gun? It was awfully close to call. If it does, that means the second place boat, the Atlas Van Lines, if it finishes in this order, could be the winner. We'll have to wait and see. The green flag is out. The green flag, not the checkers. The green flag. The green flag was out for Circus Circus. The checkered flag is out for Muncie. Muncie wins it. Muncie wins it. The Budweiser second. Circus Circus indeed jumped the gun and was green flag. He's got one more lap to go. So the Atlas Van Lines with Bill Muncy captures the 1979 Sea Fair race. Bill always uh, slept well, uh, ate well. He was never ever nervous about a race, never any fear, not a, any nervousness that you would see. The only way that you would have known, if you would have known him, is that he just talked more. He ate a great big meal the night before. That was a ritual, a big steak dinner. And then in the morning, he would drink coffee, and he wouldn't eat all day. But he'd come back into the pits after he's been won a race or won a heat or whatever, and he gets out of the boat, and he's got some things that he's got to talk to the crew chief about. And he's focused of what he's going to tell him, what went wrong, what went right, what was not correct, or so on. And he gets out of the boat, and all of a sudden, some reporter comes and stuffs a microphone in his face after losing five pounds in that race. He says, so, Bill, tell us what, and he says, I can't talk to you right now. And he'd walk off, and he said, well, who does he think he is? And that was, that's what people perceived from the press many times, that they said, well, why, why doesn't he say it? Well, let me tell you something, the same thing before racing. He's getting ready to go racing, and he's very silent. He sits there. Chip Hanauer used to do the same thing. He'd be very silent. Now, being a performer, I've worked with many performers, including myself. Before I go out on stage, I like to be alone. Maybe it's for 90 seconds, two minutes. I'm sitting there or I'm standing there getting ready to be called on stage, and I'm, I'm collecting my thoughts, collecting what I'm going to do, how I'm going to stand, how I have to walk over that microphone, exactly what my opening words are going to be, what the next tempo of the tune is. 
So it's the same thing that Bill went through. Bill would be very, once again, musically, that that's where that all tied in together. He would sit there, be alone, saying, now I'm going out with this piece of equipment and I'm going to drive it right to the, push it to the envelope to 190 miles an hour or what have you. And I've got all this equipment around me, so I better have myself together. I'm not going to be standing there laughing, smoking a cigarette, says, so, uh, how's your kids doing? And you know, he doesn't want to do that now. After a while, absolutely. I can remember if we went down to the boat to see him before he would take off on a, uh, during the trials. I never, I really didn't like to be there with the actual race. Um, I knew never to talk to him because he'd hurt my feelings because he didn't answer you back because he was focused and he had his mindset on what he was going to do. And if I said some, anything to him and didn't get an answer, my feelings would be hurt. So I knew never to talk to him until after he was all done and you wait like at least 20 minutes when he could become Bill again. I really didn't want to leave. No, I, I enjoyed working with Bill, I enjoyed racing with him, I enjoyed him personally. No, and uh, But I also wanted to move forward and, and uh, you know, sometimes people get get stuck in doing the same thing over and over and over again, and and uh, one of the reasons that we've been successful over the prior ten years is that uh, we 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 weren't happy with just staying put. We we wanted to to improve the breed, and uh, when the opportunity came around to move forward and and uh, help develop the turbine project, I, I if Bill had wanted to do that, I would have stayed with him forever. Uh, if he had been, been willing to do that, but he wasn't in a position to do it, and, and uh, I wasn't in a position to stay. You know, I, I, I had that opportunity, and I, I wanted to do that. I, I, I hated leaving Bill and our team uh, because we, we did have such a great relationship. And, and uh, in, in, in retrospect, I, I kind of I questioned it a few times, and thinking, gee, was, was that the smart thing to do? And, and you know, it, it was professionally in terms of being able to develop new things, but I, I hated losing the relationship like, like I did. And, and the other thing I, I've thought about is, okay, had I stayed with Bill, would I have been able to help prevent what ended up happening to him? You know, and I don't know. You know. I gave Bill a year's notice, you know, a fair amount of time, and I, I don't know if he thought that I wasn't actually going to do it or, or not, but I, I kept telling him that this is in fact going to happen. And, and we need to be looking for a replacement to, so that the team can continue on at, at the same level. And uh, uh, we got all the way through the season. We had a successful year in, in 79, but we got to the end of the year and you know, there was, everything kind of got dropped. Then it was, it was time for me to move on. And I, I stayed on and tried to help, but obviously I was pretty busy with my own, my own project also. And, uh, uh, I was really happy that Bill got Dave Seafelt involved because if, if he hadn't, that would, have, that would have been a disaster for him. Dave is just, he's a quality individual and very knowledgeable. I think a lot of people don't, don't give him credit for, for his knowledge in, in, uh, in the sport in, in a lot of different areas. He's, uh, Dave's got a lot of good old Loki horse sense. I mean, he can, he can understand things. And he made some changes in the boat, frankly, that, that I wouldn't have made that really improved the boat. No, I, uh, they, and they, they went very fast with that boat and, and uh, ended up doing some things with it that I, I wasn't sure that it could do. Uh, he did a, an excellent job of, of running that team. And, and, and Dave's such a likable guy that it was real easy for the crew to rally around him. Because you know, a, a lot of the same guys that had worked with me worked with him. I think they had a lot more fun working with Dave and justifiably so. He's just, he's, he's just a marvelous guy to be around. 79, that was the end of Deepwater. Uh, Bill calls up and says, I hear you're coming back over here. And I said, well, I'm coming for Christmas. Well, you haven't been to seen Francis and I for a long time. Why don't you come to San Diego before you go up and see your mom? So, well, okay, I'll do that. So, went to San Diego, get down to San Diego, and uh, Bill says, uh, geez, you know, I wish you'd stay here and help run the boat for me. I said, I, I can't do that, Bill. I don't want to do that. He said, well, you know, uh, Jim's made a deal with David Herensberger and he's going to uh, start a new turbine project up there and he's not going to be able to be with me anymore. And I said, well, you better find a new dude then. 
And he said, well, I want, I want you to come. I don't, you know, I don't know who else I can get that I'd, that I'd have that kind of trust in. And he kept, of course, saying, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I, You're not going back over there. You're not going to run that diving operation anymore. I said, no, but I'm not going back to racing either. So anyway, I, I told him that I would stop in and I would have a look at the, at the operation up there and he says, you know, just, you know, if through your eyes, take a look at it and, and tell me where you think we're at and, you know, what direction we need to go. I went home and, and uh, I called Bill up and he said, did you see Jim? I said, no, he wasn't there. He was off doing something. And, and he said, uh, well, did you see anybody there? I said, yeah. I said, I saw this young kid named Tim, Tim Taffel. Oh, good. Yeah, he says, he's a good guy. He's a young guy that just came with us and He's a real good guy. And I said, yeah, and what about the rest of the team? I said, yeah, Bill, you don't have a team. What? I said, no, you don't have a team. I said, the thing's kind of unraveled. I said, uh, Jim's real busy with Dave's stuff. And I said, it's, he hadn't totally walked away from you. He's still down here, you know, giving support when he can, but he, he's real busy with this other project, and he can only spread himself so thin. What's a guy to do? And he said, oh, I, I had no idea. Well, how many engines are done? I said, well, they're all done from last year. They're all apart. They're parts and pieces everywhere. I said, there's nothing together. Oh, my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I said, well, I don't know. What are you going to do? Well, he, just, he was frantic, you know, and he's, well, I'm going to come up there. I said, well, I think that's a good idea. That's what you should do. Come up here and get your guys together, and you guys figure out what direction you're going. He said, okay. He said, well, will you come to that meeting? Well, yeah, okay, I'll come to that meeting. So anyway, the, he did, and he came up, and he got all the guys together, and he uh, inferred to the guys that I was going to stay there, and I was going to run the thing because Jim was on this other project and one thing or another. And, and then we were, we were way, way, way behind getting things together, and when we finally got people together and we got a plan together and we got organized and we started proceeding towards the next racing season it was getting kind of late and uh, the other problem was is that in addition to building Heronsberger's new turbine boat and everything he had agreed to rebuild the blue blaster for Bill so now again down in his shop he's got multiple projects going on and he's I mean he's just right up to here with work and uh, <laughs> Well, they, they rebuilt the sponsons on it, and it used to have a, a wet fuel system in it, and they decided they are going to put bladders in it. And uh, I think just generally go through it and make sure that, uh, you know, it's not coming apart and there's no problems with it. So anyway, we got some engines together, and it was time to go to Florida, and then Jim didn't have the boat done, and he didn't. He was working on it. And we were going down there, and well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this, and like about four or five days before it was time to go to Florida, he called up and he says, "Oh, it's done. Come and get it. Come and get it." And so we went down there and we towed it up to the shop, but now it had to be painted. And so we got Van Werrigan, and he came with his truck and moved into the shop and stayed there day and night and painted the thing. In 1978, at the end of that season, I, I had been out of racing for just about two years, and and uh, my wife and I were starting a family, and I had a good job with a heavy machinery company here in Seattle, and I got a call from um, uh, Bill Bennett, who at that time was the owner of Circus Circus and wanted to start a team, and it was a good uh, financial move on, on my part and a good opportunity, and so we took it and we developed uh, in the next year and a half. Um, a new team, Circus Circus, and uh, finished second place that very first year and had one race uh, under our belt. And some things happened the following um, spring prior to the 1980 season that uh, forced my departure from the team. During that time, I got a phone call from a very, now very dear friend of mine, Glenn Davis, who was on the Atlas Van Lines crew. They were in Detroit uh, a week prior to the race, and they were having a lot of problems with uh, their boat running, the systems, and things weren't working right. And, and uh, Glenn said, here, just a minute, I want you to speak to somebody, and it was Bill Muncy. 
in all the years that I had raced uh, throughout the 70s and, and the late 60s, I never personally spent more than probably five minutes in front of Bill Muncy and, and, uh, and had a conversation with him. And here he is on the phone asking me if I would come to Detroit and help them uh, sort out some problems. And uh, it was quite an honor. And, and, uh, uh, and the, one of the proudest moments I, I ever had was to walk into the pit area in Detroit with a, an Atlas uniform on right past the Circus Circus team. And uh, it was kind of a little touche in my part. And it's Muncy on the inside or on the outside of us, of course, but closest to us on the shoreline as he wants it. And who's got that inside track? Big switch in lane positions from what we expected. Bill Muncy's taking the number two lane. Chip Hanard's right. going number three. And Dean Tennant on the outside. The three of Brett. of form as Muncy went to the inside. Budweiser took the outside and Squire Shop right dead in the middle between them as they head into that first turn down by the Belle Isle Bridge. Five laps around a three-mile course. First boat to finish is the winner. Throw out the point standings going in. And it's Budweiser after that first turn taking the lead. You can see the Atlas Van Lines is second. I see a second rooster tail which probably belongs to the Squire Shop running third. Chip Hanauer and Squire Shops is starting to take a run on Bill Muncy on the outside for second place, Larry, but Dean Chenoweth and Budweiser's open up a nice lead. Hard to see the Squire Shop covered by the mist from the rooster tail of the Atlas, but he is there about uh, four or five boat lengths behind. Then it's Kentucky on a paving, and Squire, or rather uh, Probe, is the fifth boat in this final. Channel has just rafted into that corner, made a really tight corner, left a lot of water for the other boats to dig through. Muncie had some problems and finally crossed out of it. Atlas and Squire Shop, one, two, three, and really running on the, a great surface to run on this morning. Water conditions are beautiful there. I don't think they're going to be a factor in this heat. Well, my, my position was really, um, we had a crew chief at the time, and uh, basically to do what I was asked to do, and that was uh, more or less, I, I did the engine engine work, and, um, um, and any systems problems in the boat, but mostly the engines in those days. And so my contact with Bill was still somewhat minimal. He would give feedback and we would try and sort out a problem and, and make adjustments and what have you. So uh, the one thing I did notice right away working around Bill is that uh, nobody wanted him around the shop. He was, he was, uh, he was a pain in the ass. He was, he was a great guy, but uh, he always be moving your stuff and he, he always had a broom and he couldn't stand any dirt on the floor. and. And so you, if you left your area of work for a few minutes, he'd be in there re readjusting everything. And so it was, we were always hoping Bill would find something else to do. Dean Shadoweth rounding the final turn to come home and grab that checkered flag and pick up his third consecutive victory this season. He won at Miami, he won at Evansville, and he wins here in Detroit. Atlas van lines and Kentuckiana paving were crossed together, but it's Atlas finishing second. As a case in point to show you, give you some indication of how awesome Dean Chenoweth and, you know, Dave Cully and Bernie Little and the Budweiser team are, uh, I performed four miles an hour over the world's record in Detroit and lost. He ran 14 miles an hour over the world's record. Just an unbelievable performance. And I don't know of any sport in our society where people can come, and relatively minimum expense really, and come and see second and third and fourth place teams set world's records. You, you just don't see that happening anywhere. As far as the media went and him trying to, you know, get me to be a little more open, uh, he'd pull me to interviews with him whenever he had, you know, a television interview or something. He'd come down and he'd grab me, say, you, you got to come too. But I would do him and I wouldn't say anything. I'd just sit there and nod my head at him. And I remember uh, the first time he really got me to do it, we had been racing together for Evan Root Outboards. We raced outboards together in endurance races. And sure enough, one of the races, he drove first, of course. He was Bill Muncy. He left the beach, and he never came back after the first lap. I mean, I forget what had happened, but we had a mechanical problem. 
So we were doing an interview in Seattle. This is the next summer, and he sits down and he starts telling the story how I started the race and took off and never came back. And I was looking at him dumbfounded, and finally I got mad. That's that's not true. You know, you were the one, and he just sat there and grinned at me. So he finally just kind of prodded me in or, uh, you know, tricked me into getting somewhat emotional. Would you like to introduce the next fellow? Oh, he's just awesome. He's also young and virile and studly and all those trick media words, but he's a delightful guy who has such a marvelous and exciting future in this sport with which I've been associated so long. And I've had the pleasure of being around him and working with him and running against him and getting whipped by him many, many times. And we did gather together to sort of join forces last, uh, last winter in near Long Beach to run a marathon race. And I went out in the, it was a marathon of about seven hours. And I went out in the first two hours because I'm the legendary person and I've been around so long and so much more experience and I could perform more brilliantly. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so this sounds like uh, uh, the channel. Anyway, well, I went out and performed magnificently and I brought the boat back and we were gonna make fuel change and let, you know, let Chip get in it and everything's going great. And I just performed marvelously. The boat was a winner out in front and going. He got in and he ran about 300 feet in blue. I want to introduce you to Chip Hanauer. <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead and just like my hand. I can tip over you or walk out. Do you want to give you a version of the marathon now? <laughs> You'll have you one winning. Choose. This is this. No, is, I don't want to hear the story. I had to go Bill, really Bill started in the morning. Okay, he was he's the legend, you know. So he's going to make the start, and the whole it's a 13 mile course, and they disappear. It's on the Colorado River. 300 boats disappear over the sunset. They all come back and round the buoy and disappear again. No Bill. <laughs> Bill Bill never made it back from the first lap. And tell me if you were I went a quarter of a mile from the start so and I ended up in a laundromat. We, we take off in the Team <laughs> Evan Rude, Team Evan Rude sponsored us. We took off in the Team Evan Rude truck to find him. We found him in a laundromat, <laughs> mad, waiting for us to come fix his boat. I'm only about a minute and a half from the starting line. What took you so long two hours later? It, we got bum directions and they tape a phone number <laughs> in, the, did in the board to on the me. dashboard if you have troubles along the river so you can call the pits. They tell your team where you're at so they can get a truck to you and help you. Well, they gave us some bogus information. And we went clear on the wrong side of the race course, as far away from Bill as you could get. And the poor Bill sat in a laundromat for an hour waiting for it. <laughs> we sat here and talked uh, maybe six weeks ago. And what's happened to you in the past six weeks? Well, we've had some high points. Uh, we had some good heats in Pasco. We had a propeller break, which shortchanged us. Excuse me. A little bit. But we're making progress, and uh, no fires or any more disasters. He's been on a first-name basis with all the towboat drivers in the country, <laughs> is what he's been. <laughs> I guess the question that I'm forced to ask, uh, are you going to finish this race this Sunday? I don't know. That's why we have boat races to find out. I think we will. Our crew's been working very hard, and uh, we just had a lot of crises come up. And uh, when it runs, it runs fast. But we've just had some problems. And it's like that in any sport, you know? You go through a series of... Of bad luck and series of good luck. How, has it been the same way with you? Crummy. Huh? Losing is, oh, I can't come to wits with myself. Yes, I think I've been performing well. I started out poorly. And Chip, I, he's been running brilliantly at times, but it, the Budweiser's been so outstanding, just awesome from the standpoint of, you know, performing at a world record breaking level. And uh, with all that horsepower and a boat that's just beautifully dialed in, running and driven damn good. <laughs> If it ever came to the time when you were in the business of hiring somebody to drive a boat, would you hire a guy like Chip Hanar? Bill? How about yesterday? <laughs> I couldn't get him soon enough. He is everything that a race driver should be, I think. And he's not only just in, interested in stabbing and steering and turning left. There's more to it than that. He's able to represent a corporation. He's responsive to the, the general public, which is critical. He talks and responds to media, which is absolutely critical in the support and perpetuation of our sport. He's absolutely got a brilliant future here, until he blows it. <laughs> Dean Chenoweth was going to join us tonight, and uh, Dean is at uh, Harborview Hospital as a result of his crash yesterday. Two, 
one, and the boats are at the start and finish line, and they are underway for Heat 2B. Three boats, Bill Muncy's Atlas Van Lines, at this very moment has not been seen. It's on the inside of the rooster tail. That is Dr. Toyota, who's trying to do some racing outside. Watch this first corner. This could be a honey. Muncie is on the inside somewhere in that rooster tail of the Toyota. As they come out, you'll probably see the blue Atlas first. Got washed out. He did. It looked like he did get washed out. Muncie is slowed down. Is he going to get it back up to speed again? He does. Here comes the rooster tail out of it. But Muncie did get splashed down a little bit, and he is now probably 200 yards behind the boat that's going down the backside, and that is, if my eyes are correct, to Dr. Toyota. There's your distance. There's the leader. The Dr. Toyota. Bill Muncie, let's see what kind of a lead. He's kind of down to four seconds now, so he's not laying back by any means. Well, I can't say that. I think he probably is laying back. He just happens to be doing it. Uh-oh. It was a good start. We've got a one-lap penalty on the Toyota, probably for the cutoff, I would imagine, in that first turn. A one-lap penalty on the Dr. Toyota. So from anything here that we can figure, it's probably because of that cutoff in the first turn. Again, very tight around the buoys. Look at that. Great shot by a helicopter. Bunsy on the inside. He's got the lead easily. Now he has a lap lead, plus the distance you see there in your picture. Super shot by our helicopter. Puts the on the inside now. Accelerates. Goes into the nitros as he goes down the back stretch along the log boom. Ron Snyder was up in a helicopter in a fixed position over that turn and made the call, and our helicopter was up there, too. It was a great shot. And, of course, we'd like to see it again, but Muncie was bearing in, of course, and uh, we're going to take another look at it, but Muncie was bearing in on him, and uh, obviously the judges down there, Ron Snyder said, uh, no way, you closed the door on him too close and yeah. made the call right away. Here we Here are. Here they come down. Muncie, and Muncie on the inside. Milner is making his turn, and Muncie is coming on in there as... Yeah, it's, it's no three boat links. There's no, no I, don't, I don't know that you can really argue that point very much. You'd almost have to have Clarence Darrow to get out of this one. <laughs> Once he's totally, totally. Oh, yeah. He'd need F. Lee Bailey. Just and what happened the there, too, Don, is that he, did, he went dead in the water because he took on some water and he right. managed to flood it out, to flush it out and, and uh, get back started. And then he made the demonstration of the incredible speed the Atlas Van Lines has in going clear around the course and passing them. He's Bill a happy seems man. happy. He's a happy man. He pulled it off. He really didn't lose too much time getting it started yeah. again, considering. Let's go to Elaine. Turn, Here's you, Elaine. Did, did you, were you cut off on that turn, do you think? Well, I got wet there, yeah. <laughs> you look a little wet, but uh, yeah, you made up. Yeah, a little up. damp. <laughs> That's the way the game's played, however. So you made up for a little time, though, huh? Yeah, we're running pretty strong. We can keep running like we have been. Uh, no yeah, just put it on, leave it on, let's run the final heat. You talk about the time for the final heat. You don't have much time. And, and no, we really what, don't have any. Um, are there any major things you're going to do before then? No, not really. We're not going to do all that many things. Uh, we think it's running good enough to win right now. You get into his rooster tail? <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. I drove right into it. It's my fault. Kept your engine going, though? What? Pardon me? You kept your engine going? A little bit, yeah, huh? Any, con fun. any concern about the engine because it died? No, no, no. We're playing good right now. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Bill. We'll see you later. And Muncie really turning on the coal, coming way outside, maybe testing his, testing his engine a little bit even, or rather the handling, as we get ready to start. Five seconds, four, three. Oh, boy, Alberto has jumped the gun already. There's the gun, and there goes Muncie. Muncie. On the inside, circus, circus. Bill Muncie out of the lead. Here's our shot, and they come into the south turn. What a traffic jam this is going to be. Muncie on the outside. Again, a oil bird home. Jump the gun. Muncie in a healthy position already. As the best we can tell, it looks like it's the squire shot on the inside. Into the south turn. Muncie showing no apparent problems right now as far as handling on the inside. There's your distance now. First place. Healthy lead for Bill Muncie. Right now, it's roughly three seconds. Bill Muncie, first place, going after his 59th career win. He is running and he is not looking back, folks. Here comes Butsy into the north turn. Second place, the Squire Shop. Atlas is backing down now. He's at 122.227. The Squire Shop has gone dead in the water. Right of the main straightaway, the Circus Circus going by him. We've got a fire. We've got fire on the Squire Shop. Now it's doused. He's got smoke. Let's see if he can restart. If he has smoke, technically, if there's fire, of course, he has to jump in the water. And of course, that ends the race. Is. Checking it right now. In the meantime, Muncie's still way out of the lead. Coming into the north third. He's a 
about to complete lap four of the World Championship final heat. Oh my, he'll be passing Squire right now. Don't see any problem if he goes wide. He's right in the middle, but I think the boats are spread out far enough so everybody can get by him okay. You'll see the Squire. There it is. What's he going by him? One frustrated gentleman. 26-year-old Chip Hanauer running beautifully, getting 800 points. And now he's dead in the water. As he watches the rooster tail of Bill Muncy fly away ahead of him. Bill Muncy moving down the back stretch, about to enter the north third. Oh my, Bill is showing us all something today. You can't help but wish if only Dean Chenoweth was here with a healthy Budweiser, what a battle it would have been. And Dean, if you're watching, all the respect we have to you and a speedy recovery, sir. Muncy coming out of the north third, about to laugh the Dr. Toyota. Milner Irvin, no chance of getting in the way of the Dr. Toyota now. Of course, it was the Dr. Toyota that cut off Muncy in the last race. Well, for Mr. Bill Muncy, it's been another one of those days, a marvelous day. His crew performed beautifully. Bill Muncy, I bet we'll get the, the usual clapping, the traditional clap by Bill Muncy. <laughs> The master has done it again. Take a bow, Bill. Well, that's two in a row for him in the last two races, and of course, four in a row here on Lake Washington. Four years, that is. Like I said at one stage, you either love him or hate him, but you never are left indifferent, indifferent with this man. <laughs> they did a heck of a charge, too, Mike, for that first turn to uh, really take command of the race and put the squire in a bad situation of playing catch-up, which he never was able to do. And, of course, uh, whatever caused the the engine to go, why, there you, there you are. Well, the difference was the captain and the kid. He knew where he wanted to be, and Chip Hanauer didn't know where he wanted to be. Well, Chip and Bob Style, another frustration, uh, aggravation, and whatever else because they just cannot seem to make it hang together the whole distance. Yeah, but you and I both know they have nothing to apologize for. No. That was a fine day's work for those guys, and they they uh, still, however, have not yet finished. There's the picture of dejection right oh, there. Talk about a contrast. Look at that. And then Mr. Hanauer. Oh, I feel sorry for Chip. He drove so well all day. He really did. But life goes on in hydroplane racing. Just for the facts now, Atlas now has a total of 1,200 points for the day's work. Squire with 800. Circus Circus with 825. Going over 140 miles an hour in San Diego in 1980 was, uh, was a, um, a real uplift for Bill at the end of that season. But it was still overshadowed by the fact that that uh, the big red monster griffin powered budweiser boat was was something that he wanted to to dominate was something that he wanted to conquer we still weren't qualified after we we'd messed up these three engines not qualified for the event so he says well what do you what do you think and i said you know well let's let's not monkey anymore let's get qualified let's get in the race and and uh then afterwards if you think you want to try again or something we'll, we'll do it. He said, okay. So he said, what's in there now? And I said, well, it's one of our race engines. I said, it's a, fre it's a fresh engine, but there isn't anything particularly special about it. It should be a good, strong engine, just what you would normally anticipate to go racing with. He said, well, can I try with that? I said, yeah, if you want to. He said, well, do you think it'll go 140? I said, well, it went 139 and a half. I said, can you drive it 140? Well, I don't know. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, you go out there and run around and whatever you feel like you do. If you break it, don't worry about it. We got more in the truck. We can still go racing comfortably. And if you break this one, that's, that's all right. If you, if you really feel like you want to do it. He said, well, I don't, I don't know. I, I said, well, go and you see what you think. So anyway, he went out there. Of course, we all went and stood on the end of the dock and we're watching. And he went around and went around and went around. And, and then he went a little faster one time. And he was gone down. And the guy said, oh, I don't think he's going to do it. And I said, well, I think maybe he is going to do it. I said, why? I said, because he's running around too slow for too long. He's burning off fuel. And I said, he's trying to get this thing as light as possible. I said, I think he's going to make a bonsai attempt here. 
And he said, no, I don't, I think he's thinking, he don't, something he doesn't like or he doesn't want to do it. You know, this kind of conversation's going on amongst the guys. And pretty soon he comes down again past the pit area. Now this time he goes past the pit area, he goes real deep. And one of the guys says, hey, he's going for it. <laughs> and he hammered that bugger and off he went, huh? And then uh, <clears throat> he made the run and I never saw a boat go around a corner any prettier than that thing did. It was beautiful. But anyway, uh, he came back and he says, uh, well, I guess we didn't do very good. I said, you better listen up because the people were just going crazy, applauding and everything. He said, well, what's going on? I said, you set a new record. He said, we run 140? I said, yeah, you run a little over 140. Oh, boy, man, he was up then. He was really excited. But... It wasn't on a particularly fat, uh, flashy motor or anything. It was on a, a good sound racing engine, but not, nothing that was uh, really extra special. I remember the day Bill set the average record at 140 miles an hour for an average speed in qualifying. Uh, it was beautiful San Diego evening. You know, it was like 15 minutes before the course closed. And I think I had just come off the course, so I was on the dock. And he came through the corner, and I had never seen a boat look so beautiful ever. I mean, part of it was the aesthetics, you know. I mean, it's a beautiful place to see a race anyway. The sun was setting. The boat was perfect, throwing up this huge rooster tail. And then when they announced 140 mile an hour lap average, I mean, it just took our breath away. It's like, how could a boat go 140 miles an hour? It was this huge, huge hurdle that he had gone over. So it was... One of the few boat runs I remember watching and remembering how impressed I was. After it was over with, he said, uh, uh, geez, he says, I think that's the fastest I ever went in this little boat. And I says, it probably is. I said, you probably went within five miles an hour what you went when you set the record with the Thriftway. He says, geez, is that fast? I said, yeah, figure it out. That's what it takes to do it. You got to go damn quick. In those days, uh, qualifying, I think, was pretty important, you know, and uh, I don't remember talking to him about it, but um, I remember, you know, the crew just being ecstatic. And I think everybody in the sport was, I mean, it was pretty defeating for the rest of us, uh, but I think uh, it was such a, a feat at the time, and it would, they did it so well, the boat looked so perfect, you just had to applaud the job that the whole team did. Oh, I worried about him all the time, but he never talked about it. And he would never admit that it was as bad as it was. And uh, he would never tell me that it happened. Somebody else would have to come to me and tell me, hey, did you see what went on and so and so and so? I said, no. And what happened was is uh, some guys had uh, a tape at uh, Seattle at the finish of the race when we, we won their, I don't know, in 80, I guess it was, the world championship or something. But anyhow, he came across the, the bloody finish line with the thing the sponsons flying eight, ten feet off the water, maybe possibly more than that. I don't know, but I just was, and uh, not for a short pop-up duration, but it carried and carried and carried and carried, and it was incredible. And so after I saw that, I told him, "Hey, I just saw some film of the boat running." I said, "This, this thing's, it's out of control." No, it isn't. No, it's not out of control. I said, "Well, it is, Bill." I said, "Man, it's way off the water." Yeah, but you know, I can. I can adjust and I can, I can get it down again. When it's out of attitude, I'm able to delicately move my hoof off the throttle just very carefully and get the boat back into attitude without having to lose a lot of boat speed. No, every time the boat would get up, it was always a concern uh, to all the crew members. And, uh, you know, uh, our, our concern was, was it a concern of Bill's? And, and sometimes he would just shrug it off saying, well, I caught somebody's water. And, and it got some lift off the front of the boat. Or uh, there was a lot of times that he would just tell us it was okay. There was other times that he said, boy, this is not right. And, and so it was either a propeller combination or an adjustment on the sponsons or, or what have you. But uh, in those days, we didn't have movable surfaces on the boat, so we didn't have any way to trim the boat out as it was running. We had to leave the dock with it preset. And so it was kind of a guessing game. What he would do is he would just put a little set in the rudder, just a little teeny bit. Well, when the boat's up in the air, it is not immediately going to take off. It just starts to. But when it starts to, it starts to lose the lift. It starts to slow down. It starts to fall down. 
And then he wouldn't get off the throttle, he'd just feather foot the throttle, and he'd just hang it there like that until it, when it started coming back down again, then, then he had it. But he had the talent to be able to do that. And that was incredible. Hey, I, you know, having been in this so darn long, I should have learned something by now. Uh, tactically, I think that I've always paid a great deal of attention to the sport, and I've been a student of the sport, and I still am a student, and I'm still learning. And uh, I think it's helped me a lot. I think that having driven as long as I have, uh, a more, more, many of the moves that I make that when I'm out of attitude or, I mean, getting a little looser than I should, I don't think that, you know, I'm not a giant intellect. I'm an average guy smart-wise, uh, although I, I may be a little more racing smart than some people because I've been there so long. But the truth is that most of those moves, those corrections you make to get yourself back into attitude, come as a result of conditioned reflexes and having done it so darn many times. And boy, let me tell you, do I make them work. <laughs> what was interesting about that boat is when the very first time we ran it, uh, it was you know lightweight boat. I mean, the, the boat ready to drop in the water was 5,200 pounds. And, and uh, we widened the tunnel on it. I made a lot of aerodynamic changes over the, the prior boats. And it was, it was a real flexible flyer the first time in the water. And everybody came in and said, oh, you're going to get the boat upside down. It's going to go upside down. It's going to go upside down. And, and, and they were right. The only thing is it took four years for it to happen. And, uh, uh, a lot of changes that had occurred. The boat had won a lot of races in the meantime. And uh, Bill had a lot of confidence in the boat. And he had a lot of confidence in, in his abilities, which he should have. I mean, the, the guy was was without a doubt the, the, the finest driver in the history of the sport. And I think it was after Seattle. Uh, of, of that same year, we went to lunch and, and uh, we spent about an hour talking after lunch about how the boat was running and what he was doing and how he was always running in the safety margin with the boat. And it's just, it's one of those things that you can run up to the safety margin. If something happens, you have, you have the opportunity to get the boat back. When you're running in the safety margin all the time and something happens, then you're, you're really rolling the dice because uh, there's a great likelihood you won't get it back. And, and my concern was that something bad would happen to him if that happened. One time uh, we were talking about putting an injection seat in the boat. And uh, he said, man, you just you can't stand a crash at the speeds we're going. He said, what, what can we do? I said, well, we'll put an injection seat in the boat. He says, who's going to control the button? I said, well, we are. If you get in trouble, we'll push the button and zoom, you'll go out. He said, no way, you're not controlling the button. I'm controlling the button. I said, no, that doesn't work, Bill, because you always have it under control. If it's standing on its end, you have it under control. You ain't going to press the button. So it's useless. He said, well, maybe we better think about something else.